changing perspective, the anatomical perspective, there is some more changes. Okay. Okay. Now, there was a very good observation way back in 1989 when Niels, he was one of the proponents of all kinds of body uh, surgery. He said the last chapter in the history of groin anatomy and operative repair of hernia, the text has not been written. Now, this is true even for today. So, that was way back in 1989, but also as of today. And we still evolute. We are evoluting in how we look at these viral hernia. Now, we all, we all see this is a very common picture, very, very familiar picture. And we all know the inguinal canal, we know about the leaving valve ring, the leaving valve ring. We know about the structures which are passing through it. We know about the three arteries that are there. We know about the three nerves which are there. And in addition to that, we also know the three coverings that we have. Now, it's a very, very good illustrative picture which I found out for you all. And this one you can see the three coverings, the external stomatic, the primastric, and the interstomatic patient. Now, they are derived from the three layers of the abdominal wall. And if you look at the abdominal wall, the first and foremost is the transverse abdominis muscle, and behind that lies what is known as the transverse patient, right? Then comes the transverse abdominis muscle, then is the internal oblique, and you've got the deep wall ring, and you've got the superficial wall ring. Now, as the cord structures pass, they get a sheath or a conical sheath for transverse fascia, and then they start getting these uh, coverings from the subsequent layers. So you've got the primastic, which comes from the internal uh, abdominal muscle. And then you've got the external uh, somatic fascia, which up to now was believed to be as a result of the external oblique expansion. But we now know that's not entirely true. It's basically the, the superficial fascia, which is covering the external oblique aponeurosis, which gives rise to this uh, external somatic fascia. And the sheath, we all know, or the superficial fascia, is known as the glottis fascia in this particular region. So it's basically a covering of the glottis fascia, which goes and covers the inguinal uh, structures, well, kind of structures, and this is what we know as the somatic patient. Now, the commonest approach, irrespective of the approach that we, we have devised, which were all external approaches. Now, if you look at the, the anatomy and physiology of this particular region, a proper approach should always be a preparatory approach. Now, I was sitting uh, earlier the other day, and we said that you got a garage. This was a uh, uh, comparison I also stated the other day. You got a garage, and you got a car inside the garage. Right? Now, obviously, to prevent it from being stolen, what do you like to do? You like to lock the doors. But you don't do that. You leave the doors open and you construct another wall in front of the garage. Does it make sense? It's not logical. It doesn't make any sense at all. That's exactly what we're doing in a hernia repairs up till now. Now, the basic premise is that the defect is in the, if you look at the definition of inguinal or any hernia for that matter, it is basically the weakness in the first covering layer. Because first coming there, through which the peritoneum starts protruding. Now, the protrusion of the peritoneum is very much there, even in viral hernia. But then, what is the first covering layer? It's the transalis fascia. That is the first covering layer. So, everything is protruded through weak part of transalis fascia into the canal. Similarly, for ventral hernia, similarly for femoral hernia, and so on and so forth. Any kind of hernia. So, the first layer in all abdominal hernia is transalis fascia. So, we are basically looking at what? We are looking at a weakness in transalis fascia. Now, up to now, what were we doing in inguinal hernia repair? We are covering, we are doing either a bassinese repair, which is an approximation of the conjoint tendon, so-called conjoint tendon to the inguinal ligament. Or we are doing some kind of mesh repair, which was covering the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Now, does it make sense? We are not doing anything for transalis fascia, it doesn't, at all. So, what should be the premise, or what should be the principle in repair? It should be a pre-peritoneal. So, the pre peritoneal placement of the mesh should be. Now, this is the area of the pre-peritoneal. Look at the DIR. This is the DIR, deep inguinal ring, and this is the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Now, this posterior wall of the inguinal canal does not have any muscle in it. That's a potentially weak area. And what lies behind it? What lies behind it is the transalis fascia. So, if you look at this spatula which is going behind, that is the proper area of placement of the mesh. That should be the anatomical position of the mesh, right? So that is what is known as the preperitoneal placement of mesh. Now, the peritoneal space is a relatively unknown territory. We, when we were studying, even now when we are studying, we are all designed or we are basically geared up to look at the anterior surface of the inguinal canal. We know about the three muscles, we know about the posterior wall, but what lies behind? That is what most important at this point of time. 
Why? Because as we said earlier, anatomical base should be, we try to repair that layer which is lying in between the transalus fascia and the peritoneum. So, repair that particular layer because that is where the defect is starting. Right? So, the that is basically unknown territory. We were never taught that. Even today, I don't think there is too much emphasis on that particular area to be emphasized in the learning of anatomy. So, if you have to emphasize that particular area, this unknown territory. And you don't know anything about that anatomy and you expect surgeons to jump onto the bandwagon of doing a laparoscopic repair, which is essentially a repair of transalus fascia. Now, how can you do that? You don't have a proper training in anatomy and you still want to jump on and try to do these repairs. So, what is going to happen? It's going to cause more damage than any good in this patient. So, this is an area which has to be studied much more carefully. And that is exactly what we'd like to do in the future slides. Now, that again gives us a different perspective. Now, up to now, we thought that these were uh, the isolated areas through which the hernia came out. That is, example, the femoral hernia, below the inguinal ligament, we are the inguinal hernia coming above the inguinal ligament. So, these were areas which we knew. But then what is happening? Now we have to see a wholesome approach, a holistic approach. And what is that approach? That is basically an approach what we know as the Fruchow spiriform myopectin orifice. After all, what are we designing? We got a bone here and we got a muscle out here. This whole area between this bone and the muscle, this is basically what? The pubic bone. And what is up above? The arching fibers of the atrial oblique and the transverse abdominis. I will not call it a conjoint tendon because I was stressing the other day, conjoint tendon as an entity is present only in 5% of cases. Only 5%. The rest of these, they have got a separate muscle, arching fibers of the internal oblique and arching fibers of the transverse abdominis. We do have a conjoint tendon. We as surgeons have been doing this earlier since a long, long time and we don't find the conjoint tendon. So that is basically an entity which the anatomist believes in, but we don't believe in the conjoint tendon. Anyway, so if you believe it's a conjoint tendon, you believe it's an arching fibers anyway. So, in between these two layers is the whole deep area. And any kind of increase in the abdominal pressure, whatever you're doing, you're lifting heavy load, you're coughing, you're sneezing, you're exerting, you're constipated, exert. So, the whole pressure is going to be exerted where? In this biopectineal orifice. Why am I pectineal? The pectin part of the pubis and the muscles. That's why the myopectal orifice. So, this was a whole new concept which came up. So, whenever we try to do a repair in this particular area, now what we believe is repair this whole orifice instead of just repairing one hernia at a time. Now, for example, the patient's got indirect mal hernia, we know the defect is that way. It's at the deeper inval ring. So, just don't repair the DIR. Also repair the, the area through which the, the direct mal hernia is going to peep out. Also repair the femoral hernia area. Right? So, this perspective. Now, this is basically if you put the page, turn the page. Turn the page, what is seen out here is seen from the inside. Exactly the same picture, nothing different. You are seeing it from the inside now. And that is what you see in from the inside. So that's why these lines, you see basically the muscle, you see the ileosauce muscle out here, and you see this defective area through which the vessels are coming out. This is the area through which the inguinal cord is coming out. So everything is the same. The whole thing is just turned out, and initially we are looking from, from the outside, now we are looking at it from the inside, right? Now, and that gave us another perspective. We only knew about the inguinal hernias. We all only knew about the femoral hernias. Now, if you look at the hernia equation in this particular area, now we know there are four types of hernia. This was the deep inguinal ring, superficial inguinal ring out here. This is the area through which the femoral hernia creeps out. So, one, two, and three. The two inguinals and one, the femoral. What about this number four? This was a hernia which we never knew about. Why? Because we always confused this hernia with a direct inguinal hernia. And why we did that? Basically because this protrusion is always in the region where you find the direct inguinal hernia. But later on what we found? We found that the neck of this sac in this particular area, hernia number 4, is always lying medial to the pubic tubercle. Whereas the defect, uh, the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, always lateral to the pubic tubercle. It cannot be medial to it. So, if a hernia, the sac is lying lateral to the pubic tubercle and the other is lying medial to the pubic tubercle, they are not the same. And that is why we understood that this is basically what we now understand as an external supravesical hernia. Why supravesical? Because this is the region where you have the bladder inside. Of course, so two types, external and the internal. Just forget the internal part at this point of time. Just remember the external. So, what are we looking at? The four hernia in this particular area, and when you want to repair anything in this particular area, why not repair all four at the same time? All the more necessary. Because if you remember, 
And if you know your theory, the one of the mo most common causes of femoral hernia is what? A previously repaired inguinal hernia. They are one of the most common causes. So what does this tell you? This basically tells you that you have repaired inguinal hernia at the same time now you are making this patient more susceptible for what? A femoral hernia. What does it happen? It's very simple to understand. It's simple to understand in the sense that if you repair, just look at this figure. Now, if you're repairing, one of the common repairs is bassinese repair. What's bassinese repair? You approximate these arching fibers to the inguinal ligament. Agreed. Now, when you do a bassinese repair, you're pulling the inguinal ligament up and you're pulling the conjoint end down. Why? Because these are sutures which are going to approximate these two things. Now, when you're pulling the inguinal ligament up, what's going to happen? What happens to this particular area? The femoral canal increases the size. If the femoral canal increases in size, now there will increase chances of protrusion of the hernial sac through the femoral area. So, you have made it more susceptible, the patient more susceptible to a femoral hernia. And that is why, that is why, there is another reason which where, where you have to believe that you have to carry out a covering of all these four areas. Right? Now, the terminology. So, basically we have decided one thing, we agreed on that thing, and that is we have to repair the preperitoneal area. Agree. Everybody agrees to that as of today. That this is the more scientific, the most anatomical and more physiological repair. One more thing. Why most anatomical? Because remember the basic principle of surgery is what? Trying to bring back the abnormality which is there in that particular patient to as near normal as possible. That should be the aim of your surgery. Bring it back to normal. And if you have to do that, you have to repair this particular area. Right? So we understand that this was basically four names. but. Preperitoneal is the most common name which is now stuck and we commonly use this. What is to be remembered is that this is a space between the peritoneum and the facial transversalis. Trans that we call a preperitoneal. So now we are talking about that space between the peritoneum and the space between the transalis fascia. If you look at the transalis fascia, this is the transalis fascia. So the whole thing is that now we have to understand what is the transalis fascia. This is believed to be just a thin fascia. But no, it's not. Why? Because in this particular area, remember the posterior wall of the inguinal canal is made of what? Oh, it's a so that means it must have some kind of a, a support in this particular area, some kind of a strength in this particular area. Why? Because it's preventing the formation of a hernia. Every patient doesn't have hernia, does he? Every patient doesn't have inguinal hernia. But every patient has a transalis fascia in this particular area. Every patient has a weak uh, potential in this particular area. But every person doesn't have a hernia. So obviously there must be something in this particular area which is strengthening this transalis fascia. Now if we look at transalis fascia, we now understand it's a three-layered structure. In the inguinal area, it's a three-layered structure. Structure, layer number one, layer number two, and then of course the preperitoneal layer. Okay? Now what is important in layer one and two is you have to know this that the, all the blood vessels which are lying behind the muscle in the particular area are always positioned between layer one and layer two. Very, very important fact. Why? Because whenever you're doing dissection in that preperitoneal area, as we do in laparoscopy, the moment you have some kind of a bleeding, you are where? You are between layer 1 and layer 2. Wrong dissection. Wrong dissection. There should be no dissection per se. Your dissection should be posterior to layer number 2, which is layer number 3 of the transalis fascia. And this should be taken. So, it is important to understand that all kind of vessels, like for example, if you have a gastric artery, the deep part of the inferior artery is for two parts. Right? So, you can the deep. The deep part of the inferior gastric artery is lying where? It's lying in between these two layers. All kinds of vessels, like example, the pubic vessels, the uh, iliopubic vessels are lying in this particular space, are all between layer 1 and layer 2. Okay, so this has to be understood. Now, let's look at these two layers. Please see this picture, right from uh, external oblique, internal transept domain. Now, see the green line and see the purple line. Layer number one, transalis fascia, layer number two, transalis fascia. And then see this yellow. That is layer number three. See where the vessels are going. The vein and the artery. Where are they going? Between the green and the purple. That means layer one and layer two. Right? Now, where are we going to dissect? Now, this, this is the peritoneum. The triple line is peritoneum. So, where are going to dissect? This layer of dissection. Do you dissect it out here? No, the moment you do that, torrential bleeding or very uncomfortable bleeding which obscures everything in a surgical field and of course going to harm the patient. Why is the patient bleeding? So, the basic principle is the moment you start dissection in this particular area, there should be absolutely bloodless. Absolutely bloodless. And that you understand that now we are in the right place.
That is very important to understand, right? Another picture depicting the same thing. See, a much more enlarged picture. Now, if you look at this, start from the skin, go downwards, rectus abdominis, you got the posterior rectus sheath. And this basically just behind is lying what? Transalus facial tip number one. Then you got what? Then you got the layer number two, the brown one. The vessels lying in between these two. And then you got the yellow structure. The yellow structure is what? The preperitoneal, the two periperitoneal facial. That is layer number three of the transalus facial. And then what do you have? You got the peritoneum. Right? So, this just to make you understand that this transalus fascia is very, very important and going to the proper layer is very important if you want to prevent the bleeding. Right? Okay, just to give you an idea. See, it's a very substantial fascia. See that fascia? Being done laparoscopically, see that fascia? You can sort of move. Simple, thin layer. And you hardly see any bleeding out here. You see any bleeding? No. Same thing now being cut. We go to the right plane. Why? Because to position the mesh out here. That means the mesh or repair has to be done where? Behind layer number two. In the layer number three. Right? So you go in between layer two and layer three. That is where you dissect. Never dissect between layer one and layer two. Never do it. Right? We come to the next important part. Now, we just now said there has to be something reinforcing the transalus facial. It's a thin layer. It's a thin layer. Any part of the body. But I just said that in the lower part, it's got three layers to it. Three layers transalus facial. In addition to that, in addition to that, it is also substantially strengthened in this particular area. And that's what we call the transalus facial analogs. Analogs basically mean thickening in the particular area. Thickness which are reinforced the transalus facial in this particular area, preventing the egress of the peritoneum in this particular area, preventing the formation of a inguinal hernia or a femoral hernia or external supermatic uh, hernia, external vesicle uh, hernia, right? So, what are these areas? Now, if you look at this picture, you'll find that there are four structures out here, right? You got these arching fibers. Can you see these arching fibers? Now, this is a picture where you have to believe that all layers have been removed. We are just having the transalus fascia in front of us. That means we remove the external oblique, remove the internal oblique, we remove the transalus muscle. We just find the transalus fascia out here. Right? Now, if you see this, if you see this, the arching fiber, now these are fibers which are running parallel to the arching fiber of the transalus muscle. These are arching fibers. Right? What we know is the transalus facial arch. Transalus facial arch. First analog. Second, can you see this particular area? which is lying the deep inguinal ring. Now, if you look at the deep inguinal ring, how the position? It's got two pruras to it. And these pruras always look upwards and outwards. That's how they look. If this inguinal area, they go upwards and outwards. They're going upwards and outwards. Similarly, to this, we have got a thickening in this particular area, which is a real crura. That's a real crura. So, you've got the two pruras of the transalus fascia, which are the pruras which are lying in the deep inguinal ring. Right? These are basically what? They form a sling. They form a sling. After what's happening in these particular areas? In this particular area. Now, if you remember the physiology of the inguinal area, whenever the muscle contracts, that's the time when you have an increase in the pressure. Agreed? Now, whenever it freezes, now you have to reinforce this particular area. Now, this reinforcement can, can be done by what? By two things. The shutter mechanism and number two, the sling pulls upwards. If the sling pulls upwards, it is now fitting more snugly around the cord. It's fitting more snugly, it will not allow anything to go through the ring. And what is the shutter mechanism? The shutter mechanism is basically what? The arching fiber transfer abdominis and the, and the internal oblique, whenever there is increased tension, these arching fibers are not straight enough. When they become straight enough, they would descend down. And then become parallel to what? The inguinal ligament. So they descend and become parallel, giving support to this particular area. That is shutting the anything one layer. Right? So here, what is happening is that these arching fibers would be approximated to another analog, which is called the iliopubic tract. This is the iliopubic tract. Can you see this tract? This is the iliopubic tract. What is it? What is it? This is basically a tract which is running parallel and just behind the inguinal ligament. The third analog of transalus fascia. So I've got three important analogs. We've got the arch, we've got the sling. And we got the hyaluronic tract. Three things which are strengthening the transalus fascia in this particular area. 
right? The other two analogs are not very really important as far as it's concerned. The Cooper's ligament of the pectineal ligament is basically when you look at this figure, see this figure on the pubic tubercle, it is now lining the ilopectineal line. See this particular area. And what are these fibers in between the, which is believed to be, in one ligament and the Cooper's ligament? The lacrimal ligament. And if you see this lacrimal ligament, see this lacrimal ligament, and see this opening in the lacrimal ligament, that is the opening through which the femoral hernia starts to protrude. But now we know differently. This lacrimal ligament is not a part of the external blade, not a part of the, of the inguinal ligament. It is basically a part of the transalis fascia. Or in this area, the ilopubic tract. So it is the fibers of the ilopubic tract which are now reflecting from the pubic tubercle onto the ilopectinal line, forming the pubic ligament. And in between these two would be the fibers which are strengthened by transalis fascia, giving rise to the lacrimal ligament. Right? So that is the fourth. Ilopectinal arch as a, as a entity as far as the uh, genesis or prevention of hernia is concerned is not very important. Right? So this is basically the ilopubic tract. This is much more clearly seen. See this picture. See these fibers, the ilopubic tract, and then you got the reflecting fibers. And here basically you got the, the lacrimal. Can you see this ligament? The lacrimal ligament. And then you can see the area through which the vessels are moving inside. Now this is the area where it broadens up or there is defective through which the femoral hernia comes out. That is the area. So the femoral hernia would be below the inguinal ligament, the other two hernia would be above the inguinal ligament. Very clear. If you understand the anatomy, very, very clear. Nothing wrong with this anatomy. Nothing very difficult to understand. Right? So, this is basically the other and that is the ilopubic arch. This is an arch which is basically something separating the two compartments below the inguinal ligament, one through which you have the muscle, the iris muscle, the other through which you have the, the vessel. So it's got two parts to it, the vascular compartment, the lacking of the sorum, and you've got the lateral muscular, the iris uh, which is muscular. Right? So these are the two areas through which you have the egress. So ilopectal arch as an entity is not very important as far as the, the genesis of prevention of hernia is concerned. Right? But the other four are. Now, let's see this. Now comes the part that you have to see when you go laparoscopically inside. Now, what is that? What is the picture we are talking about? Now, see this ligament, the central ligament. Can you see the central ligament? And then you see these two ligaments. So, you got these are now termed as median umbilical because all of these are going towards the umbilicus. And then you got the medial. So, you got two. Median, medial and lateral to it, you got what? You got the lateral umbilical ligament. Three ligaments. Now see, you see this? I'll just refer to this again. But here, can you see the inferior gastric artery going up? So that is the lateral ligament. So you got the N ligament, you got the L ligament. Sounds much better. Remember that. And then you got the, the third one, and that is the lateral umbilical ligament. See this? It's much more clearly seen out here. What are these fibers? Uh, what are these structures? The two structures. What? The testicular, the part difference. Here you got a ligament out here. Which ligament is this? The L ligament. The median. The median. Right? Here somewhere would be the median ligament. And here because you see the inferior pigastric Can you see the inferior pigastric artery? The faint trace of inferior pigastric artery. Much more seen. Better seen in the, the subsequent pictures. So it would be the lateral umbilical ligament. Now why are these ligaments important? Because they demarcate the areas to which you got the genesis of the hernias. So the median umbilical ligament, which may be the center ligament, running from the central line of the pubic symphysis up to the umbilicus. Why the umbilical ligament? Because all of them would be converging of the umbilicus. All they converge at the umbilicus. That's why they don't have the umbilical ligament. So this is basically what? This is basically the obliterated part of the uracus. You know what the uracus is. Okay? Now, if you look at the L ligament or the medial ligament, is the obliterated part of the umbilical artery. Is the total of it obliterated? No, it's not. The lower part is not obliterated. It is replaced by what? Or it gives rise to the superior vesicular artery. Right? So, the N ligament, uracus, supposedly totally obliterated. Of course, you have a number of diseases, but it's not. And the L ligament, the medial ligament, is basically the obliterated part of the, of the umbilical arteries. Part of it is being replaced as the superior vesicular artery. And then we have the lateral ligament, which is basically what? It is the inferior epigastric. Right? Now let's look at another picture. Let's look at this picture. Very complicated? No, it's not complicated. Just stick, stick to this part. Just stick to this part. Just look at this. We'll talk about this later. 
Now you see this one central and you see the medial converging where? So they have like this. They all converging them like this. And then you got what? A lateral. Right? Now, if you look at the center, I just now told you. Now, why are they important? They are important because they demarcate triangles. They demark triangle. The supravasal triangle, the medial triangle, and the lateral triangle. And why do we need to know these triangles? Because they are the areas to which you got the ingress of the various vertebrae. That is where they start protruding. That is where they start protruding. Right? So, that is why these ligaments are to be importantly understood. That you have to understand what the ligaments are. Right? There is another picture. This is basically a Cadbury picture of the same thing. This is basically. Uh, let, let's go further. I have just not told you what about it. Now, this was. I showed you that old. That particular area. I, I don't know if you were paying attention or not. The first time we saw the picture, so you may not be paying attention. So this is basically the transfer vesicular fold. So what is this transfer vesicular fold? This is basically a fold which is extending from the bladder onto the area of the deep valve. See, this is the deep valve ring, and you got the inferior gastric artery, right? So what does it denote? This is basically the denotion of the true part of the deep valve ring. Why? Because this band and cord structure are the firm adamant of fusion of the what is fusing? The peritoneum. What is this fusing? The prepetal fascia. We just talked about that. And what is transalisation sling? I told you what the sling is. So if they adhere in this particular area, it is the true site of the DIR. Right? So this marks the true site, and that's why the, the, the sling is also known as the monk's foot. I forgot to tell you that at that point in time. It's also known as the monk's foot. So this, see in this picture, this is the true area. Okay? So that gives you an idea where the DIR is, the transmissile port. Another very interesting observation. And over the period of time, the, the Hasselbeck triangle has been redefined. Over the period of time. Now, when the Hasselbeck triangle was defined for the first time, see this is the area. What is this? What is this? It can be gastric. What is this? The bone. And what is this? The rectus. Now, today we understand what? We understand this as the Hasselbeck triangle. The spinal ligament, inferior gastric, and let go of the rectus abdominis. That's what we know as of today. But initially, in the 18th, when we described for the first time, early 19th century, it was basically what? It was basically this. It was covering the whole of the myofacrial orifice. That's what we just not told you. The flu shot of the orifice. That was the whole of it, was the Hasselbeck triangle, which we now understand as the the triad of Hessels. Right? So that was, and then, then came the new definition which is still sticks. But we as surgeons, now remember, what is a triangle? A triangle is a unique planar structure. Is it? Is it not? In geometry, what is a triangle? A unique planar. That means it is a planar structure. Now look at these three structures the inferior gastric, the is known as the Are they the same plane? They are not the same plane. They are different planes. So how can you define a triangle in reality? Is it geometrically correct? No, it's not correct. You are trying to define a triangle using structures in three different layers. That's wrong. That's wrong. So the surgeons came up with a new definition. A new definition has a bad triangle. What was the definition? Now, we just not talk about the transalis fascia. Can we utilize structure in transalis fascia to define the Hasselbeck triangle? Yes, we can do that. Would it be uniplanar? Yes. One single layer. Transalis fascia layer. So what are these structures? These structures are basically what? You got the arch, you got the sling, and you got the lipid tract. Simple. So now, as of now, Hasselbeck triangle is redefined in certain books as the area which is lying in between the arch, the sling, and the lipid tract. One single plane. Geometrically, absolutely correct. Nothing wrong with that. Now. So that initial definition was not correct. We as surgeons don't believe that. And why also? When he said, what's about the Hesselbeck triangle? It is the area through which the direct malignant is protruding. We just now said it has to be a weak area in the Hesselbeck triangle. Does it define the weak area? Yes, it does. It does. So it is more pertinent to define the Hesselbeck triangle based on these boundaries rather than based on this boundary. Right? So that is the Hesselbeck triangle. These were the change from perspectives. Now, so when you have the prepetal area, you got prepetal spaces. And why these spaces important? Because remember, you're doing a dissection in this particular area. This is an area which was never dissected. 
BS herniologist, never did it initially. When I was studying, it was basically only the outside, nothing inside. The moment you put a thing inside, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. It's going to lead to torsional bleeding. We didn't understand what's lying inside. We just knew that underneath was lying, the external eyelid vessel, the artery and the vein. And you, if you put a finger inside, you're going to damage it. That would be it. But is that the only structure which is likely to damage? No. You've got a number of other structures. And what are these? So we have to understand what are the spaces related to myopathy orifice. So we know about the fruit chows, the whole thing. The Ridgeus and the Bogoros are two spaces which needs definition. And then, of course, the retroperitoneal paradigmatic space. So, what's this? Now, if you look at the transalis fascia, this is a fascia coming like this. From your back, from your back, it's coming anterior. Right? Go back from there, from the paradigmatic spaces. And the supercandal fascia is the part of the transalis fascia. After the supercandal fascia is too late, then it comes down, comes is one, and then when it comes anterior, it gets reflected in the transalis fascia. There go transalis fascia, is all gone. So, it's one single fascia, one single fascia. Right? So even the retroperitoneal paranoid spaces is a part of the a part of the preperitoneal space. Agreed? Okay. Now, first of all, the most important space of Ritzius. Now we always knew about the space and we knew that this is a space lying behind the pubic bone. Is that correct? No, it's not correct. It's not correct. Why? Because it's not only behind the pubic bone, it extends right up to the umbilicus. Right up to the umbilicus. So, we now define space ridges as the area or the triangle which is lying from the umbilicus extending below behind the pubic bone. That whole thing is space of ridges. And why is it important? Why is it important? Now, these are the, the definitions. So, posteriorly was lying, the vasico umbilical fascia. So, all these fascia, all these spaces are where? Where are the spaces? Between layer number 2 and the peritone. That's layer number 3. So, it's layer number 3 which has got all these spaces. So, what's lying posteriorly? Is going to the visceral and lacrimal fascia from the bladder and the peritoneum right up to the umbilicus. You know, the laterally, close laterally along the lines of fusion where inferior epigastric artery. And of course, anterior pubic bone and then right up to the rear similaris, <coughs> posterior fascia up to the umbilicus. <coughs> Excuse me, right? Now, this was a very important space. Why? See the structure. That is space of ridges. The whole thing. This place ridges. Now let's go further. Let's see something more. Can you see the pubic bone? That's the pubic bone. Right? And what I'm intersecting, I'm dissecting in front. So what's lying posteriorly? What was lying posteriorly is the bladder. So this is a dissection being done behind the pubic bone and in between the bladder. Space of ridges. There is a space, the pubic bone, and there is a space behind. Right? That is the area to be dissected. Has to be done very, very carefully. Why? What's lying posteriorly? The bladder. You are liable to damage the bladder. That's one structure which is very important, which should not be damaged whenever you do a dissection in the retropubic space. A space which needs proper dissection in every kind of laparoscopic hernia repair. It's very important. Until you do that, you cannot position a mesh properly. Right? So, that has to be defined. Now, this is a better picture. We want to understand what is lying in the red uh, in the space of ridges. So, this whole thing is the space of ridges. This whole thing is space of ridges. What are these? External vessels, the ileum vessels. External oblique, artery and vein. Okay? Pubic bone is here. The bladder is here. So, this is the space which is lying just medial to the pelvic brim. The brain is defined by what? The external like vessel. That's what defines the brain. So there's something lying inside the pelvic brain. Okay? Now see what the vessels are. See all these vessels. Now what's here? The obturator foramen. You from a knowledge of anatomy would know where the obturator foramen is. Obturator foramen is to the or you got the obturator foramen is in the area where you got the obturator dermis muscle and through that. That's lying where? The medium most part. So it is lying very deep in the pelvis. Very deep in the pelvis. Can you see this obturator vessel going out here? But what else can you see? Can you see this vessel? These are abnormal operator arteries. So what is the percentage where you find the abnormal operator arteries? So that's what defines the abnormality, what defines the importance. You find only 1-2% cases, don't worry about it. I hardly ever see it. That's what you can say. But no, the incidence of abnormal operator or accessory operator vessel is almost how much? 33%. One third of the individuals would be having an abnormal operator vessel. 
abdominal operator is right the artery and the vein and what does it do it is basically anastomosing with the normal operator so how do you recognize this the question will be how do you recognize this it's very important very very simple recognizing this vessel is very simple and how do you do it any vessel any vessel a and y any if it is running across the pubic vein is an abnormal vessel very very simple if you find any vessel if this is a pubic bone any vessel running like this is abnormal any vessel running parallel is a normal vessel very simple nothing problem see this vessel running across the pubic bone coming from where from the external ilia in the epigastric so these are normal vessels which are commonly arising from the epigastric vessel and the external ilia and what do they do they descend down across the pubic bone and then anastomose with the operator vessel see this is anastomosis site can you see these vessels coming out here so any vessel running along is a normal vessel any vessel running across is an abnormal vessel i can't emphasize this enough i can't emphasize this enough but that is a very very important feature of any kind of laparoscopic repair the moment you see a vessel running across stop be careful because if you have a bleeding in this particular area you have troubles on your hands you have trouble on your hands right i'll just tell you what the trouble is so remember all the space of disease is important for the simple reason that you have to identify any abnormal vessel number 1 and you have to, that's operative vessel and number 2 you have to identify the bladder out here before you go and proceed with the dissection the third thing you have to identify is the vas deferens again a feature of the retrobilic space it ascends from here and enters the canal the dir that's where the vas deferens is right so that is very important as far as the space of this is concerned now laterally where does it stop where does it stop this is one space which are now being recognized people still don't recognize it but a very very important space i'll tell you why i'll tell you why now when talk of the space of this we know it goes from the umbilicus behind the pubic right agree but where does it extend laterally it has to have an extent laterally and the moment it goes up to the medial ligament medial ligament it becomes space of cross that means the lateral extension of space of regis is a space of cross is it a large space no very small space see how much 13 to 15 mm wide and 4 to 6 mm deep it's only what 1.3 cm and 1.5 cm how much is it are it this much <laughs> why no space of cross cross was a scientist or he was a surgeon who first of all Try to enter the external eye or try to approach the external eye vessel. And he decided, look, I will approach this area with very thin incision, and I will go deep directly into the external eye. Right. So initially, when we talk about the bogros space, it is basically a space which was designed to approach the external eye vessel. Very easy. But later on, what they decided, or what they found on laparoscopy, at that time nobody was doing laparoscopy, so they didn't know what how what is lying just behind it. What is lying behind it is basically what is known as the Arterial arcade of Vanderbilt, venous arcade of Vanderbilt. Where is it lying? Again between layer one and layer two, but where? In between the lateral edge of the rectus and the and the and the inferior big aspect. Simple. I'll show you the figure. Look at this figure. Look at this figure. Can you see the lateral edge of the rectus? And you can see the inferior big aspect. See this? What is this? These are branches or veins coming out from the rectus abdominis muscle. First, second, and third branches. And astrosing is what? The inferior big aspect. Forming what? The circle of Vanderbilt. Or venous arcade is Vanderbilt. The moment you identify, it's not present in every patient. The moment you identify it, be careful. You don't ever damage the inferior big aspect. If you do, then you've got trouble on your hands. You've got a lot of cauterization. Any vessel seal has to be used. Often it don't succeed, and you are not bleeding on hand, right? And the vessels which are coming out and are sourcing to the to the rectus seal vessel. So rectus seal, the first, second, third branch of rectus seal vessel. In addition, what else? In addition, what we got is the aliphatic vein. So these veins, see the veins, how they running? Parallel. Is any vein running like this? No. So the moment you see any vessel behind on the bone running across, you have. Uh, abnormal vessel. So these are the vessels which are now shown. This is the circle of venous arcade of Vanderbilt. 
right? So the next time you go in for a laparoscopic approach, you see a laparoscopic approach, always pay attention to this, which is lying just behind the abdominal wall. Again, layer number one and layer number two. So remember, the principle of any kind of laparoscopic repair is always dissect in what? Layer number, layer number three, layer number three. Never between one and two, layer number three. The basic principle of any kind of laparoscopic repair, okay? Now, what are the contents of this particular area? We just now decided about the, the rigid space because that's the most important that we have. But what about the other? The other things which we see in this particular area is the arteries, the veins, the lymphatic nerves are important. And then, of course, the nerves because these are basically the areas, the structures that you are liable to damage when you do an laparoscopic repair. Just coming back to the surgical position. So, you got the external eyelid, we all define that. The testicular artery, we define that. And we got the differential artery. I told you about the vast difference. It's got the artery along with it. So these are three important vessels that are going to be damaging. And you see this picture, this picture, you can see the testicular, sorry, you can see the, the testicular vessel, you can see the vast difference of vessels around this and this. So this is the area which is likely to be damaged when you go ahead and do a dissection in this particular area, right? Now, the bend circle, I already told you, this is the area where you find the bend circle. See this? Still and you got the bogono space. A very, very small space out here, okay? The lymphatics are not so important because these are, uh, but the, the thing only is that they may be obscuring an underlying aberrant operator vessel and that is more important when you do a laparoscopic inguinal, uh, sorry, laparoscopic iliac lymphatectomy. When you're doing that, you have to be very careful that you don't have an underlying vessel. That's very important. So, they may be obscuring underlying vein and uh, the moment you damage that vein, of course, you can imagine what's going to happen, right? Now, with these structures lying out there, these structures lying out there, what were they important for? I told you, these are areas which are very, very important. And we need three defined areas. We have three defined areas whenever we do a laparoscopic repair. And these three defined areas, which are the areas where you're going to cause maximum chances of injury to this patient. And they variously defined, the one which is very important is the corona mortis, circle of death. Why is there a circle of death? Because this is an area where you may be damaging. See what's your when damage occurs, imagine what it was is the abnormal or the accessory of the vessel. And I just now told you, the moment you damage this vessel, see how thick it is. See the diameter of this vessel. You may have a very thin operator and the, most of the work is now being done with the accessory operator. A very thick vessel. The moment you damage it, let me tell you one thing. You cannot cauterize it. You can't. You cannot stop the bleeding by cauterization. You can't do it. The more pottery that you apply, the more the bleeding. The cauterizing is what? The bone. Is it liable for or is it, uh, can it be cauterized? Most times no. You can't do it. The only thing which can stop the bleeding is pressure, pressure and pressure. Just apply pressure. And if fortunate enough, yes, the bleeding stops. Unfortunate, convert. Convert. Convert basically means what? Convert your procedure from laparoscopy to an open procedure. Even in the open procedure, it becomes very, very difficult. Instead of this one small incision for inguinal hernia, anteriorly, we have to give a large incision, we are going to control this person. So everything is in a soup. Give the maximum. So don't do it. Don't do it. The circle of death is basically this area of damage. Now why is there no circle of death? <coughs> you can see it, you can stop it, do whatever you want. So why the patient die? He should die. The problem is, whenever you do any kind of laparoscopy, the first principle is, you have to create a pneumoperitoneum. For pneumoperitoneum, you have to create a pressure so that the space develops. Now, when you're doing an open surgery, what do you do? You use retractors. When you use the retractors, you can see what's lying inside. Agreed? So, you have to have vision, proper vision. But you're not applying any retractors, you decide to do laparoscopy. What is there? Just three small holes. So, how do you create that space? By gas. But known as a nemo Nemo retraction. There's no nemo retraction. So, similarly, when you're doing a pre-peritoneal section, you have to push in gas. At what pressure? At around about 10 to 12 or 13 or 14, whatever you want. But it should never exceed 16 millimeters. That's the safe level. <coughs> now, when you apply that kind of pressure, what is the venous pressure? Much, much less than that. So what's going to happen? When you're doing a dissection with a pressure of 40 millimeters of carbon dioxide, these veins are collapsed. You're very happy that look absolutely bloodless, there's no bleeding. You drag everything out, close the patient, send him to the ward. Within one hour, this patient has severe hypotension. And you can't understand what has happened. You can't understand that. Why this patient is having hypertension? Right? The first thing you should come to your mind is, I may have missed a bleeding vessel. And what's the most likely space? This is space. 
Why? So at that time, you had been using a high pressure, the vein was collapsed, and you dragged everything out, the ports out, and you closed the door. So what is important? What's important is that before you pull your ports out, reduce the pressure. Reduce the pressure. Still looking. Keep looking. Reduce the pressure. From 16 to 14, 12, 10, 8. Even at 8, you can have a very good visualization. No problem. Bring it to 6. At that point, if you show that there's no bleeding, yes, drag the ports out. Right? So remember, this is why it's no circle of death, that you're missing a venous bleed, which would keep on bleeding in a post-operative period, and it kills the patient. As simple as that. That's why it's known as circle of death. Right? So it is an area lying behind the pubic bone, which is basically concerned with what? With the accessory operator vessels, or any other vein lying in this particular. It's not only this uh, accessory operator. Any vein. I told you the highly pubic veins. They're also running out here. If you're damaging that vessel. So any vein lying in this particular area, if you're damaging that particular area and not careful enough to visualize whether it's been damaged or not, that is the area where you got the coronal mortis. Right? Now, the other veins, uh, the vessels. Now, see this picture, a diagrammatic representation. So this is basically an upside down. That's an upside down picture. That's how you look. You're standing out here, and that's how you look when you when you dissect it. Right? This is the ileosauce muscle. You got a vein which is forking around. Uh, sorry, the, the nerve which is forking. You see the fork? And you got another nerve out here, and then you see a nerve out here, right? Now, which is important? This is an area where you got the fork, and this fork is a what? The genitofemoral nerve. Why not a genitofemoral? It's got two branches to it. The genital branch and the femoral branch. So this is basically the genital branch, and you got the femoral branch. Femoral branch enters the thigh. The second is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. The lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. That's the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. What lies more laterally? If you're dissecting more laterally, then you got the ileoinguinal, and further laterally, you got the iliohypogastric nerve. All parts of the lumbar flexion. You know that, right? Now, the whole principle is that if you're dissecting this particular area with the swast muscle, never ever try to dissect the swast fascia. Never do it. Why? Because these nerves are lying in between the swast fascia and the swast muscle. That is the area where they lie. So, as a principle, whenever you're doing dissection in laparoscopic, if you're doing a DEB, you're doing a DABB, in both the instances, you have to dissect. You have to draw the peritoneum back. You have to position the mesh up top. So, in drawing the peritoneum back, that area is being dissected. So, never try to see these nerves. Look, I'll, I'll try to demonstrate these nerves. I'll push the face off and I'll try to demonstrate the nerves. What's going to happen to this patient? post op neuralgia. So, don't do it. So, try not to bring or breach the source patient. Don't do it. Right? And that's why they're important. So this is the genital branch which then enters the DIR. The femoral branch is goes under the inguinal ligament, enters the thigh. That's why no lateral is of thigh and this is the lateral of thigh. So femoral, lateral. Now, just lateral to this, if you're dumb enough to go deeper. Why do you call dumb enough? That means basically you're not a surgeon, you should be laparoscopic surgeon. If you are you're dumb enough to go dissecting, dissecting, dissecting. What are you going to line up with? The femoral nerve. The femoral nerve. And the moment you do damage the femoral nerve is both what? A motor and a sensory nerve. What's going to happen in this patient? You can well imagine what's going to happen in this patient. Right? So don't be dumb enough to go and start dissecting just by the side of the swast muscle. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. Right? So it's lying somewhere deep side. That's why it's not being stated in this picture because you're not supposed to be looking at the femoral nerve. It's not supposed to be demonstrated when you're doing this particular thing. Right? So you got what? The two branches of the genital femoral, the radicals of thigh. Now, if you want to go further laterally, you should not be doing that. If you want to go further laterally, this is not a nerve which should be regularly demonstrable when you're doing this kind of a repair. But if you are, then this nerve which you see out here, first of all, you see the ileoinguinal, and then further laterally, you see the iliohypogastric. Remember that. First ileoinguinal, then iliohypogastric. Is that clear? So these are the nerves. Now, what's the importance of these nerves? How do they get damaged? Number one, I told you, the fascia, the source fascia. You damage the source fascia. Next, you apply a traction. You dissect the sand back, you have also taken up the source fascia, you dissect it back, the nerves come along with it. They are raised up. What else? You can be applying staples. So, same the principle, I don't know whether it's in laparoscope surgery or not. You're putting in a mesh. Simple principle, you put in a mesh. Mesh is something foreign. So, how do you ensure it's lying in the same area? You have to fix it. You have to fix it. Either do it with the help of sutures, or you fix it with a known as stapler. Just like a stapler. You know what a stapler, paper stapler is? Suddenly you got surgical stapler. So you just fix it. Now the site of the fixation of the stapler is very, very important. 
You have to apply these staples at points where there is no underlying nerves. And Prince, I will tell you how you do that. You can transect, you cut a nerve, very calmly do it. I see some structure, let me be more efficient, let me draw everything out and I cut a nerve. Again down, you are being down. And then compression of ILA hematoma over the kidney. You were not careful enough, you saw some amount of bleeding, look, this will stop. I am not worried about it, I come out. What happens? Keep from bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. A hematoma forms, cause pressure. So these are four mechanisms by which you can have a nerve injury or symptoms of post-operative neuralgia in a patient where you are doing a laparoscopic repair. See, these things never come in an open repair. Do they ever? No. Do we ever enter this area? No. These are all peculiar to a laparoscopic repair. That's why in principle said is a laparoscopic repair is much more complicated, I wouldn't call it dangerous, complicated as compared to open repair. Yes, agreed. We all agree with that. But still it's got its own advantages. Right. So in principle, how do you uh, prevent the formation of neuralgia? Right. The most important. So these are basically the effects. What you can do with, a, with a, how they can be injured. I'm, I'm not going to deal with that. They can look up. Staples. I told you staples. Most common method of nerve injury. The most common cause of nerve injury. You are applying those staples. So where should you apply them? Laterally, it should be above the ulubic tract. You all know that. See the tract, apply the staples above. Never apply any staple below the ulubic tract. But one thing we just don't know, that they should be applied at least 3 to 4 centimeters above the ulubic tract. Why? One simple reason. That all these nerves could be having 20-30% aberrant branches which are crossing above the ulubic tract. If it is so, then the staples that you apply above the ulubic tract can well be injuring one of those nerves. Again, you are Again, you are So remember, what has to be remembered is that the staple preferably should be applied 3 to 4 centimeters above the line of the alveolar tract. Is that clear? So that is the best part. And then, of course, I told you the people love injury. I think we will skip this, right? Huh. One thing very important is that when you apply these staples in the midline, or sorry, just lie to the midline, it is very liable that one of these staples are going to injure the inferior picastric artery. Inferior acid vessel. Again, a troublesome bleeding and hematoma. So, the two sides very, very important. The staples applied on the muscle should never be piercing the inferior acid vessel, and the staples applied in the cranial area where you have to fix the mesh should never be below 3 to 4 centimeters below the, uh, uh, above the elevator tract. That area should be clear. Right? So, I just not told you the critical anatomical areas, we talked about the condom models. What are the two other areas? Again, the critical area, whenever we talk about laparoscopic repair, we talked about the corner model. See these three areas. So, this was the corner model. We already talked about that. Then you got, see this area, the mass difference. And what was this? The tessellar vessel. What's lying inside? In between. The triangle of doom. Why do you call it triangle of doom? What's lying inside? What is lying inside out here? Underlying vessels. Which? The external underlying vessels. And the moment you injure them, you're doomed. The patient is doomed, you're doomed. So, any dissection in between the vas difference, see this is the vas difference, see the structure, vas difference, and see the structure, tessula vessel. So, any dissection in between these two, it makes a triangle, that's what the triangle of do. Any dissection underlying this particular area should be a superficial dissection. Never go deep. The moment you go deep, you have labral damage in these two vessels. And you can well imagine what's going to happen in this particular area. Lateral to this, I just now showed you all the three nerves out here. I told you about what? The femoral branch, genetic femoral, the radical nerve thigh, and then for the laterally, the ileal branch nerve. Right? So that is basically, you damage these nerves, you are treading on what? The quadrilateral of pain. The three areas when you have to dissect in the laparoscopically, medially you got the circle of death, then you got the triangle of doom, and then you got the quadrilateral of pain. That is basically an area which helps you to decide what could be the complication. And these are the areas where you have to be very, very careful. Right? So, these are the three critical areas. Now, when you talk about the inguinal approaches, just a few words about the inguinal approaches. Do you think? Dr. Bhavi, we have time? Okay. So, just the approaches. Now, one thing we talk about the open approaches, it still sticks. Because if you look at the oval white figure, how many, how many surgeons are doing laparoscopic approach? 15%. 20 percent, slightly increasing now. Only 15, 20 percent are doing laparoscopic. That means the majority of cells are still doing a open cardiac repair. 
Almost 70 to 80 percent are still doing open hernia repair. So when you define or what you what you decide what the open hernia is, you have to understand what the open hernia is all about. Now, open hernia repair is basically divided into two types: the anterior and the posterior approaches. Now, what anterior was posterior? The anterior repairs is defined as a repair which utilizes any layer which at any time is anterior to the what are the legs anterior to the cord? It will be anterior to the cord? Yes, lateral part is anterior to the cord. Only medial it goes forming a kind of arch and goes posterior to the cord. Trans abdominis, anterior to the cord. So it's arising in the lateral part of the alleg bone. Right? So or the inguinal ligament, sorry. Or the inguinal ligament. So basically all these structures are what? Anterior structures. Now part of them are lying anterior to the cord, lateral to the DIR, medial to the DIR, and they are lying posterior. External oblique at all places is anterior. So any repair, any repair where you utilize these three layers would be a true anterior repair of the, a true anterior open repair. But if you use a structure lying posterior at all lateral medial, then it would be a posterior repair. A major structure lying posterior at all areas, medial lateral, transalis, fascia. The Cooper's ligament. So any repair, any repair which utilizes transalis fascia, we are about open now. Forget the lab school for a moment. Open repair. Any layer or any repair utilizes transalis fascia for the repair is a true posterior repair. The rest of them are all anterior repairs. Or posterior transalis fascia, the preperitoneum. Again, a posterior repair. So that's how we divide the repairs into the anterior and the posterior repair, right? So the most commonly done are the three procedures. I just mentioned the other one, but there are three very commonly involved: the lichen stees, the bassinis, and shoulder repair. They are all anterior repairs. The true posterior repair is the Cooper's ligament repair and the preperitoneal repairs. They are all true posterior. So don't forget this differentiation: the true anterior and the true posterior repairs in open hernia repairs. The two important hernia repairs, right? Now, whenever we do a hernia repair, there are three terms that we need to understand. One, otomy, graphy, and plastomy. The otomy as a general means what? Open and closure. Simple. Right? In a hernial sac, what do you do? You open, you decide whether there's any structure, especially the distance lying out there. If you're face sure nothing lying there, you don't even open the sac. What do you do? You open, cut the sac. What does cut mean? Estimate. Is it otomy? No. So what should be the term? The proper term should be herniectomy. Do you ever use this term? No, we don't use it. That means in principle, we are using a wrong surgical term to define what we routinely do in a hernia repair. It should not be a herniotomy, it should be herniectomy. But as of now, things have changed. Now we are doing a true herniotomy. Do we ever cut the sac? Is it recommended? No, it's not recommended. Except in few specific instances where you need to cut the sac. Otherwise, you not Need to cut the sac? No. What is recommended now? Dissect the sac and push it back into the pupil. If at all you want to, you can open the sac. So now we can agree with the term herniotomy. Before, we never agree with the term herniotomy, it should have been known as herniotomy. So that means, in principle, we don't tie the sac anymore. We don't excise the sac anymore. Why? Remember, the sac is made of what? Variety peritoneum. What kind of nerve supply does it have? Sensory? Autonomic? Sensory. If you tie something, what's going to do? Sensory supply. Pain. One of the causes of post-operative pain in a normal area after repair is the tying of the sac. Never do it. So now we agree with the term hernia. Please, we don't. Or we didn't. Then you have wrapping and plastic. Very simple terms. Very commonly used terms. But you don't know the definition to be. Raffi is the definition. Don't forget this. You can write down. Raffi basically is what? The approximation. What approximation is very important. Approximation of what? The two layers they are trying to repair, are trying to bring together. Plasty on the other hand is what? Bridging. Is that clear? One is opposition, the other is, or approximation, the other is bridging. In plasty, what do you do? Do you approximate the two edges? No. You bridge it with something, whatever you want to use. It could be silk, it could be steel wire, it could be skin, whatever, or facial order for that matter. You are bridging it. The most commonly, of course, is our 99.9 percent meshes. Okay, so you can do a herniotomy, just plain simple herniotomy. Don't combine with raffi and plasty. In which group of patients? Children. Children. Congenital hernia. You do a raffi and plasty? No. You just do a, a sac. 
section ligated in congenital hernia we still ligated we still ligated right and then push it back into the to the dir right that one group patients where still this is has to be done but otherwise by and large in every other hernia it has to be either surgery with dapi and plastic and as of today what is more preferable plastic in all hernia patients you have to involve hernia patients it should be a plasty why because rapies do not give the same kind of low recurrence rate as given by the plastic except in one repair one repair and that is basically the repair i hope you know what the basically repair is you find the proximate what the arching fibers of the internal oblique and the transabdominal preferably only transabdominal remember not the conjoint and at only 5% only so what should be preferably approximated the transabdominal to the internal ligament right that is the preferable now you are approximating i just not only tension over what tension over the arching fibers tension over the uh, ligament now the modification to, uh, to this procedure we try to decrease the the tension let's forget that but what is happening in this this is one hernia which has stood the test of time despite the fact it is rapid and it still until lately was the gold standard why do i say lately because now there's a different gold standard now how do you select a procedure gold standard it gives you the minimum uh, morbidity and gives the best results right when you talk morbidity minimum complications and minimum recurrence rates despite the fact the rapid will give very good results and one thing which is very important is that it was also being replicated by the residents this what now suppose the procedure starts today and the consultant does it he done let's say about 100 150 and the uh, resident is now learning this procedure he has done only 4 5 or 6 he has done seven procedure now this is one procedure where the recurrence rate for the residents and for the consultant is almost equal almost equal that's why it's through the test of time almost equal but what about the other procedure no the other procedures there was a different recurrence rate for those who were untrained or less trained and much higher or much lower for those who were highly trained that means the consultants had a very good figure of recurrence rate very low and the residents had a very high figure so when you talk about a procedure being replicated basically at all group of surgeons new surgeons less trained surgeons highly trained surgeons consultants you should be having an equal amount of recurrence rate and this was the reason why basini stood the test of time but now that stage and what changes that now it is the lichenstein repair which is basically a plasty which is now the procedure right now when you do a preperitoneal approach now what said the other group of patients were that the third is the preperitoneal so you did a anterior repair you did a posterior camera going to go to the dio that because we are now concentrating on the preperitoneal can you do a open preperitoneal space repair can you go behind into the preperitoneal space by open method yes you can do that you can do that you can do that has been done since you know, about what last 100 years now but never a, a hernia or a repair which is basically Uh, highlighted never never highlighted but they was being done what is now mean as laparoscopic approach was done even about 50 years back but nobody thought of it in those light that's a, a changing perspective again that's what a uh, change in our perspective so these are approaches which are basically the important ones the anti mal approach the kugel approach and the war approach i just, just tell you what these approaches are uh, just by simple figures you may not like to go into the details of this but they just repairs which are important now kugel's repair is one which is still being done by open uh, repair by open hernia surgeons and this basically just above the see this is the dir just the dir you give a transverse incision and through the incision you go into the preperitoneal space that is you go behind the transabdominis and the second layer of the fascia now into the layer three of transverse fascia now when you go to this particular area you got the specially designed mesh it's got a ring around it the mesh and the moment you put it in it expands it expands opens up and that opening up then places it in this particular area now what are you covering you're covering the internal canal from behind that is the kugel's repair right or you can have another repair and this is basically the stopa gpr with now this gpr vs repair was the basis of all today's laparoscopic repair a very very interesting repair but a very very morbid repair why this was an incision which was extending right from one end to the other end of the lower abdomen that means from dir on one side to dir on opposite side you can really imagine the largeness of the incision and then what happened he went into the preperitoneal space 
And when you went to the prepared space, you could position a mesh very well in that prepared space. So basically, the principle is what? Prepare it only placing the mesh. What does the laparoscopic hernia do? That is what is being done in a laparoscopic hernia repair. The prepared placement of the mesh. Right? So this was on which it was based all the repairs or the TEP or the TAP repair. That was the basis of all these repairs. That's why this was thought to be the starting point of all laparoscopic repairs. Right? The nearest post to a posterior prepared repair, again, this is an area with the deep null ring, you go about 3 centimeters above and length 7 to 8 centimeters, you go behind transfer abdominis and transfer fascia and dissect and to the plate on that. So this was the nearest repair. So these were repairs which were accepted as very common repairs. Now coming to the important laparoscopic repair. Not a very uh, long lecture, I'll just give very short clips on this. Now if you look at this, this is the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis. You have the anti spinal spine somewhere here, and you got the pubic, the pubic tubercle out here, and this is the pubic bone. Right? Now, you got a TEP repair, you got a TAPP repair, or you could be having a repair, what is now known as ETP repair, or extended TEP repair. Now, this is just the placement of mesh, uh, the core placement. You all know that whenever you do a laparoscopic repair, for those uninitiated, what a laparoscopic repair is, you basically are creating holes in which you put a steel tube. And through this tube, you put an instrument so that it becomes easy to maneuver an instrument. That is basically laparoscopic repair. Right? In one, you put the telescope, in the other, you have a working instrument. So, when you're doing a TEP repair, you got, now this is the umbilicus for you. So, just one below, there's above about 2 to 3 centimeters above the pubic bone, and one midway in between these two. This is the routine site of the trocar placement. You know, trocar, trocar placement of the TEP repair. In TAPP repair, again, this is common, just below or above. And then you got at the lateral edges of the rectus abdominis, either in the same line or just below this line, you know, the TAP repair. Now, TAP repair is totally extra peritoneal repair. What does it mean? Totally extra peritoneal basically means you never open the peritoneum. You go straight away into the pre space. That's why totally extra peritoneal repair. The TAP repair is known as what? Trans abdominal pre -peritoneal. Trans abdominal basically means that you have to go to the peritoneum, into the abdominal cavity, and then go into the pre space. That's why it's known as trans uh, abdominal pre space, right? So, both of them are approaching the same space, but through different routes. In one, truly extra peritoneal, in the other, trans abdominal. And then now you've got what is known as the extended TP repair, where this was thought to be giving a inadequate exposure, so we shifted above, and now this whole area is being dissected, so we say we've got an adequate area to which you can dissect, we can see everything. That's why it's known as the extended TP repair, which is still not called the fancy of most of the surgeons, right? I'll just show you very small clips, they're just four or five minute clips.
this rule within 24 to 48 hours. So this is basically the gold standard as of now. It's the gold standard of therapy of cancer. Because I said earlier, eighty percent.
is so very small. Now see this is the umbilicus and you have this above the umbilicus. This is the pubic bone and this is the goes the digi strata. So this opening is above the umbilicus. There the DP would have done below the umbilicus. So this is a supra umbilical area. So I'm not in this just the same just like in a DP repair. Okay? So just the difference in the pore placement. I think that's all. If you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them. Any questions?